All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get started here. Well, hi everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon or evening, wherever you are in the country. Uh, my name is Aura. I am one of the members of the ASMBS APP committee, and I'm gonna be your moderator for today's lecture. Um, we are really happy to have uh, Dr. Patterson here for us to give us our lecture on the vitamin B1 deficiencies. Um, we all know in practice, we see a lot of this, so it's really important for us to have a good updated um, practice for it. Um, the the kind of the, the game plan for being for today will be about a 45 minute lecture followed by a 15 minute Q and A. So please add any of your questions to the comment box. I will be um, able to read those off towards the end. Um, and then after our lecture and Q and A session, we're going to have about a 30 minute networking session where we can just kind of chat with each other, see what we're all doing in the different parts of the country, um, and just get to know each other a little bit better. But for now, let's go ahead and start on our lecture. Again, I am super honored to present Dr. Emma Patterson as our speaker today. Please go ahead, Emma. Thank you very much for having me. All right, <clears throat> and this is one of my <clears throat> very favorite topics <clears throat> currently, because I think it's really important <clears throat> and under-recognized and under-treated. All right, you seeing my <clears throat> first slide? Yeah. Sorry, I was already on mute. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Excellent. All right. So I'm going to talk about thiamine deficiency, which is a bona fide clinical emergency. Um, <clears throat> I'm a consultant for Medtronic, nothing to do with vitamins. And, <clears throat> you know, vitamin B1 or thiamine is just so important because, you know, even though we <clears throat> test and track a lot of vitamins, this is the only one that's really an emergency. And so we have to know this one. You know, we have to know that people can get deficient very fast and we have to be aware and treat immediately. What's happening? Hmm. Oh, <clears throat> okay. Not sure how to advance. Oh, click. Oh, okay. Okay, learning objectives for today are to identify patients who are at high risk of Wernicke's, uh, describe the classical clinical triad of Wernicke's encephalopathy, discuss the diagnosis and treatment of Wernicke's encephalopathy, and describe the long-term neurologic effects of Wernicke-Korsakov. And so, and this is why um, it's so important and gets depleted so fast. And I explain this to every patient. And, and actually our approach in our practice is, is not to test like ASMBS recommends, which is perfectly fine. Uh, we just go ahead and treat everybody with extra thiamine starting from two weeks before surgery for six months. But thiamine or vitamin B1 is, uh, the daily requirement is actually very small, but the human body stores only a very small amount and it has a short half-life of nine to 18 days, and therefore that's how it can be depleted in just two to three weeks of not eating very much. And thiamine, as I'm sure a lot of you know, is found in many foods, including pork, seafood, <clears throat> some grains and nuts. And, but many people would be deficient just getting it from food. So beginning in the 40s, um, our flour was uh, fortified and also um, some cereals and baby formula. And um, starting in the 40s, and in 1943, the FDA issued a statement that food fortification contributes substantially to the nutritional well-being of those who uh, consume it, and it's been broadly and uh, voluntarily adopted. And in the U.S., just a couple of years ago, <clears throat> interestingly, the NIH said there's no current data on rates of thiamine deficiency. But then if you look at the uh, NHANES data, or however you say that, um, they concluded that if it were not for fortified uh, foods, deficiencies would be rampant, and that only approximately 41% of respondents, or sorry, 41% of respondents, a huge amount, got less than the one milligram per day from food. So perhaps, uh, you know, we're all kind of anti-carb in the bariatric world, but perhaps flour is not so bad. And um, some data show that Wernicke is, is not so rare. So I'm going to show you the official numbers on how rare it is, but seems that really it's vastly under-recognized. And I'm on a personal mission to educate the world about this so we can prevent a lot of permanent brain injury. Um, so what does thiamine do? Three main things. So energy production or ATP for our whole bodies. 
It's important in cell growth and functions, and particularly in myelin sheath maintenance. So I'm going to briefly go over these. Um, so thiamine physiology. So we absorb uh, thiamine from our food through into the small intestine where it's converted into free thiamine. And then in erythrite, in the erythrocytes or red blood cells, it's hydrolyzed into the active form uh, thiamine triphosphate or TTP. So now you're probably having nightmares about biochemistry. We're going to briefly hit the Krebs cycle. Don't worry, very briefly. And so then the TTP is carried by the red blood cells to the liver, heart, and muscle. And then through the uh, CSF, through the blood-brain barrier, and uh, coats the brain. So it's very important. And so just a brief refresher on cellular anatomy. And then these are the mitochondria, right? They have membranes and they look like uh, bacteria and some, you know, it's thought that they actually evolved from bacteria that got into our cells. And if you look inside the mitochondria where the Krebs cycle happens is in the matrix here. And just briefly, the Krebs cycle. So the TTP is an important cofactor in this whole uh, mechanism where we take oxygen and uh, create ATP for energy and a byproduct is uh, CO2, so the cellular respiration of oxygen to CO2, and the TTP is a cofactor here, helping the acetyl-CoA through the Krebs cycle to produce all our energy. So this is why, you know, the main symptom patients complain of is weakness, actually. And then the myelin sheath, quick refresher, it uh, looks kind of like mitochondria too, but the myelin sheath here speeds the conductivity across the axon of the neuron and uh, is protective uh, for the neuron. So very important, all right? So I've mentioned obviously Wernicke is in all the learning objectives. So it is the key to thiamine deficiency or it's what thiamine deficiency leads to. And it's an acute neurologic syndrome caused by thiamine or B1 deficiency. And its reported prevalence is very, very low, but I think we're really just starting to realize that it's vastly underrecognized. And the pathophysiology, as we went over, is that it's an important cofactor in the, in the Krebs cycle, and disruption reduces the ATP production for energy and actually results in shunting to glut glutamate production, free radical production, and neuroexcitotoxicity. And these mechanisms result in cell death, including some of the brain cells, and they can never regenerate. And it impairs myelin sheath maintenance. And some of the neurologic, the neurologic problems can be permanent if this is not immediately recognized and treated. There we go. And so B1 deficiency affects <clears throat> many parts of the body. In terms of the brain, it causes fatigue, depression, memory impairment, brain dysfunction, CNS disorders, causes difficulty breathing from lack of energy. Um, fast pulse, metabolic acidosis, lactate's actually increased a little more, the lactate production when you're not using the Krebs cycle. And the key thing is to remember, deficiency causes anorexia and indigestion. So just like anorexia or vomiting can lead to thiamine deficiency, then once you have the deficiency, it's also causing the anorexia and indigestion, just kind of like dehydration. You know, if you have anorexia, you get dehydrated, then the dehydration leads to further <clears throat> um, nausea, vomiting, dry heaves. And so it's really important because what I see many times, I do a lot of expert witness work, which we'll get into the medical legal implications, is that the surgical team, the bariatric surgery team, when someone's coming in with nausea and vomiting, they rule out an anatomic problem and then they kind of wash their hands of it. And they forget that, oh, no, we're six weeks out, patient has thiamine deficiency. If you give them thiamine, all their symptoms would go away. Berry berry is really just another name for Wernicke's and then, or dry berry berry. And then you probably heard of the wet berry berry, which is the heart failure that can result. So who's at risk of developing Wernicke's? Well, <clears throat> you know, most of our patients, it's going to be the, the decreased access, but there's really five categories of what causes thiamine deficiency. And I'll briefly touch on these. So decreased access to thiamine or food, decreased absorption in the GI tract, decreased storage in the liver, which is more rare, impaired utilization, which is quite rare, 
and increase metabolism, which are, are key areas uh, to think about and that we see. And so the medical conditions associated with it. So in terms of decreased access, there's uh, dietary deficiency, anorexia, fasting, alcohol abuse, malnutrition, and sometimes uh, lack of thiamine and TPN, or vomiting. And common causes are hyperemesis gravidarum, bariatric surgery, and now, of course, even the weight loss medications or endoscopic procedures, anything that can cause vomiting can cause thiamine deficiency. And then decreased uh, GI absorption from the small intestines, so such as Crohn's disease, pyloric stenosis, peptic ulcers, diarrhea, or after ruinoid gastric bypass surgery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not sure why. Sometimes there's one advanced. There we go. Decreased storage capacity, uh, as I said, much more rare, such as end stage chronic liver disease, impaired utilization, really rare genetic disorders, but increased metabolism, uh, common things, you know, dialysis, hypermetabolic states, such as sepsis, burns, trauma, hyperthyroidism, or certain rapidly growing cancers. So there are many things that can lead to this. And so you've probably heard of this, the classic clinical triad of Wernicke's, which includes um, eye signs, confusion, and ataxia. Now, if you see all three of these, like bells should be going off, that this is definitely Wernicke's and just go ahead and treat them. However, this full triad is apparently only present in about 10% of patients. So it's not going to be so obvious. And interestingly, um, <clears throat> Kane et al., and I forget the year, but uh, many years ago, uh, proposed a set of criteria that have since been validated for Wernicke's. And you only need, and this is going to be probably quite shocking, but to diagnose Wernicke's requires two of the following four. And notice the first one is dietary deficiency. All of our patients have. And so then essentially, if you have one of the triad, either eye signs, cerebellar signs, or a mild memory impairment, that's a clinical diagnosis of Wernicke's. And it's actually very sensitive and specific. So using those cane criteria, sensitivity of 85% and specificity of 99%. So shocking, I know, but true. And here's some, some data that there's been an increase in um, diagnosis, recognition, and publication of cases of Wernicke's. So, you know, it's doubled over the past couple decades and still likely vastly underreported, as we know from some autopsy studies. And so the prevalence of, uh, and there's just been a few autopsy studies that I can find, but in patients with alcohol dependence, the prevalence is quite high, 12.5%. And then there was a study <clears throat> of autopsies on ICU patients, and they found that in those that um, where they found evidence in the brains of Wernicke's, only 20% had previously received an actual clinical diagnosis. And again, only 10% exhibited all three of the classic triad of Wernicke's. And, and one autopsy study, and this is, I think, particularly scary, that 30% of patients presented with a coma. And, and the thing is, in the ICU, of course, there are many manifestations of altered mental status, and it's nonspecific. And patients can have sepsis, hypoxia, stroke, intoxication, other encephalopathies. But it doesn't hurt to just give them some high-dose IV thiamine. Fortunately, thiamine seems to have very little to no side effects to give. So you should always just err on the side of treating if you suspect Wernicke's. And here's how they're going to present. They're going to show up in the ER with nausea and weakness, nonspecific. And so many of them will be post-bariatric surgery, our patients, alcohol-dependent, hyperemesis, trauma or burns, or sepsis. And it is, I like to sort of correlate this to like DVT prophylaxis. It is low frequency, high severity, right? But DVT prophylaxis is on everybody's radar. Wernicke's prophylaxis and treatment doesn't seem to be. And so we need to focus on prevention, similar to VTE, and we need routine low-dose prophylaxis, i.e. a good quality vitamin, bariatric vitamin with higher doses of thiamine, or just give, every, give everyone the extra thiamine if they're having a high-risk condition, 
such as hyperemesis or bariatric surgery. And just 14 days of thiamine deficiency can lead to irreversible brain damage. And unfortunately, I have seen this a lot in the cases that I have reviewed. Fortunately, I've also seen this, uh, seen patients come in with this clinically and treated them. And it's like a miracle in front of your eyes when they get better, when they can't walk and you give them thiamine and then they're walking the next day. Um, so treatment is an emergency similar to a VTE. Time is of the essence and they need high dose intravenous thiamine immediately. First dose stat. So how are they going to present? Well, the early symptoms are nonspecific. Fatigue, mood changes, mental fuzziness, memory deficits. The family will just say, and the family is generally speaking for the patient when they come into the ER, that's a tip off. Like mom just stopped talking. She's not remembering things. And then it goes to, they won't, won't eat, not eating, not sleeping, GI discomfort, they're either vomiting or they just don't want to eat. And then as time progresses, then they start getting the ataxia, ocular abnormalities that may complain of double vision, blurry vision. Um, and we'll get into the physical exam of that. So on history, you want to ask about weight loss, weakness, confusion, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, of course, increases the losses, blurry vision, trouble walking. And they'll describe their legs just feel heavy, like lead weights. And they may have tingling in the extremities, uh, uh, hands and feet. And then medically, of course, you want to know if they've had recent, you know, bariatric surgery on pills to make them vomit or cancer, hyperthyroid, sepsis, or fever or trauma. And then a physical exam, they can be tachycardic, lethargic, um, vomiting, of course. And then they may have, you have to specifically look for this and test them for lateral gaze nystagmus. It's quite striking. They may have ataxia. You now, a key part, of course, to know if they have ataxia is you have to have them get out of bed and walk. And a common problem I see when I'm reviewing these kind of cases is that they didn't have them walk. And it's quite striking. They'll need help to walk. They're very slow. They have a wide gait. They're not swinging their arms normally. And they'll be, they can be, as a progressive, uh, weak on physical exam. And so treatment is an emergency. As I said, you have to promptly clinically recognize that it's a clinical diagnosis and you go ahead and treat. If it's not promptly, adequately treated, there's permanent structural changes of the brain that will never recover. And the reason you have to treat fast is we don't have like a rapid uh, thiamine assay. It's a whole blood test has to be sent off. So frequently the, the right tube isn't drawn. And even if it is, it takes four to five days to come back. And those four to five days are critical. So the best diagnostic test is actually a trial of thiamine. So if you suspect someone has Wernicke's, you can send off quickly the whole blood thiamine and then immediately you bang in stat, the first dose of high dose IV thiamine. And the exact dose uh, isn't agreed upon, but there are, are guidelines from the, the neuro societies and they say 250 to 500 IV Q8 hours. And you go for at least three days. And so you have to admit them as an inpatient and you continue treatment like this until there's no further neurologic improvement, which, which may be a week. But symptoms and signs will start to improve within 24 to 48 hours. And then once you've done your three days or they're completely fine or no further improvement, we switch them over to 100 milligram two or three times a day long term. And so the diagnostic tests are just confirmatory. So there's the lab, as I said, <clears throat> draw the level, treat empirically. And then there is some imaging. CT of the head of brain will always be normal in Wernicke's, but MRI can be more helpful. It has a low sensitivity, about 50%, but a pretty high specificity of 93%. There we go. And so these are, you need the T2 weighted MRI. And these are the areas that will uh, light up uh, the mammillary bodies, colliculite, periventricular gray matter, 
and the thalamus. And these um, areas um, correspond with areas of necrosis in the brain, edema, mesogenic edema, and actual uh, necrosis. So once you're seeing these, it's not going to be reversible. And then there are, and I never seem to uh, see these being done, but you can get an EEG and it would show diffuse uh, slowing of postsynaptic potentials. And that's late stage where in a key, so they're unlikely to recover. And you can get an EMG and they're going to have diffuse exonal sensory motor neuropathy. Now, very sadly, and this is what I hope that we can all uh, try to make an impact on here. Currently, it's estimated that 80% of patients with acute Wernicke's encephalopathy progress onto the Korsakoff syndrome. And that's unfortunately what I, I see in my expert reviews. And remember, that one is where they have persistent memory deficits, both antegrade and retrograde. So they have trouble uh, with learning. And because they don't remember things, they have confabulation. So they fill in the blanks by fabricating memories. And this rarely resolves. I don't think it ever resolves and, and these patients may need permanent institutional care. And that's what I see happening a lot. Actually, you have someone who's very high functioning or working and they end up in a nursing home. They can't walk to the bathroom. They can't feed themselves. They can't drive. They can't do their job. So they are seriously permanently disabled. <clears throat> and so there's been a systematic review of Wernicke's after bariatric surgery done in 08. And they looked at uh, uh, 104 cases and 84 had uh, enough data available to analyze. And they had bi gastric bypass or other procedure in 95% of cases. And 94% were admitted to hospital for Wernicke's within six months of surgery. They had 90% had frequent vomiting. And they were vomiting for a median of 21 days at admission. And then the brain MRI lesions were characteristic in about 47% and incomplete recovery in about half. So that's where I think we can do in bariatrics a lot better. And memory deficits and gait problems were very common sequelae. And the implications are that bariatric surgery training programs and center of excellence programs should include education on the possible nutritional complications of weight loss surgery with thiamine or B1 being uh, number one. And that thiamine administration is advisable for all patients readmitted or reporting frequent vomiting, I think after anything, but certainly after bariatric surgery is a simple, safe, inexpensive and efficient preventative measure. All right, so a little bit of malpractice in bariatric surgery. So recently last year, year uh, John Morton and others published this uh, closed claims registry on the top eight uh, bariatric malpractice cases. And um, so death obviously was up there and leaks, and bowel obstructions, technical errors, wound infections, bleeding, perforation, and nutrition deficiencies in 5%. And I think this is actually... Um, underreported. They were looking at, you know, the primary reason for the claim. But what I find when I'm reviewing cases is perhaps the, the patient's initial problem was a leak or bowel obstruction. And maybe that was diagnosed and treated appropriately or not. But then a month later, everyone's forgotten about the patient's nutrition. They're just happy they're alive. And at two months, the patient now has uh, Wernicke's and it's not recognized. So I see it as a primary problem and a secondary complication after other things. And so who might be named in a Wernicke's malpractice claim? Well, anyone who sees the patient. So from the front door of the ER, the bariatric surgeon, and I, I personally think we have the biggest responsibility here because we are the people altering the person's GI tract so that they can't eat very much. And so we are the ones causing their vitamin deficiency. So we have to be aware <clears throat> and diagnose and treat this. Um, GI doctors are often consulted about this, the neurologist, and they often miss it too. Residents or fellows, PAs, nurse practitioners, registered dietitians could all be named in these kind of claims. Common breaches of the standard of care that I see sort of in any bariatric um, malpractice cases fall in a few categories. 
such as there, I didn't think there was an indication for surgery or there was a lack of informed consent or they had medical conditions suboptimized. And then we get into poor performance of surgery, delayed diagnosis of complications. So that could be many things, including thiamine deficiency in Wernicke's, missed diagnosis, Wernicke's there. And then, and then sadly, sometimes I see that the thiamine deficiency does get diagnosed and then it's just treated with 100 PO daily and that's not gonna cut it. That'd be like giving someone who's got a PE the prophylactic dose of, of Lovenox when they need the full dose at that point. And so I just have uh, one case to review with you. And this is a very typical scenario that I see. And so we got a 45 year old female with a BMI of 45, 43 year old female, whatever, typical patient, has a sleeve for morbid obesity, discharged home post up day two on a full liquid diet. Instructed to take a chewable multivitamin daily, but she struggled with her fluid intake. And so she shows up at the ER for dehydration on post op day seven. Her vitals and CBC and BMP were normal. And she's given two liters of fluids and she felt better and was discharged home. But then she's back at the ER a week later, so two weeks post op now, with dry heaving, lethargy. Again, vitals, blood work normal, given two liters of fluids, felt better and sent home. And then what happens? So then she has her scheduled appointment two weeks later, so four weeks post-op now, complains of nausea, vomiting, double vision, or weakness. Vitals are normal, but has a flat affect. Weight loss is more than usual, 40 pounds instead of 20. And the assessment was good, concern not getting enough fluids or nutrition, and labs were ordered. CBC comp nutrition panel, B12, thiamine, and ferritin. Patient is again sent for two liters of fluids, an upper GI, and the bariatric surgeon informed. Somehow the patient doesn't get the labs. Sometimes it won't advance. Sometimes it will. There we go. All right. So she's back in the ER another week later, now five weeks post-op, right? Now we're really getting into the danger zone and she's got symptoms now. So now she's got Wernicke's, right? Uh, vomiting, double vision, trouble walking. This is Wernicke's 100%. Vitals and CBC and BMP normal. Given two liters of fluids and meclizine for vertigo. I see this all too often. Felt a little bit better. Discharged home. Back at the ER, <clears throat> two more weeks later. Now by EMS, and this is classically what happens. A patient's in the ER at least four times, and the last time or two, they're coming by ambulance because they got weakness and confusion, and they, they can't walk properly, and the family can't even get them in the car to drive them there. So when they start coming in by ambulance, we have to take this very seriously. Again, the vitals are normal. Bariatric labs are ordered. Admitted under the hospitalist. Surgeon consulted. He's reviewed that upper GI from a few days ago. It was normal. Does an EGD normal. Washes his hands of it. Notice I say he, I should say she. She, the bariatric surgeon, washes her hands of it. Uh, tolerate clear liquids for a bit. Discharged home on Zofran. Then patients back in the ER two more weeks later, nine weeks post-op. Now can't walk. Isn't talking. Family's concerned. She's had a stroke. Prior labs were reviewed, albumin, prealbumin, potassium are low, B12 is normal, classic B1 not collected. I see this a lot. They didn't pull the right tube, so it wasn't sent. Neurology was consulted, and in this case, they diagnosed Wernicke's clinically. They sent the thiamine lab, and they did the right thing, gave her high-dose IV thiamine, recovered some functions, but now is legally blind. I haven't actually seen a case where a patient went legally blind, but I have seen very, it has been reported and I've seen patients where they lose their hearing in an ear um, and anything like that can happen just overnight. 
And so my opinions in that case were that the bariatric surgeon, nurse practitioner, and ER physician would all be negligent because they failed to diagnose Wernicke's and give high-dose IV thiamine in a bariatric patient who was clearly present, I mean, had high-risk presentation the first times, and then by the last time, definitely had uh, Wernicke's. So in summary, the thiamine deficiency, I think it's prevention, prevention, prevention. You need a high index of suspicion. And anyone who's vomiting needs a banana bag. You know, that has at least, that has 100 milligrams of thiamine. So it's not enough for Wernicke's, but for that patient in between who's not tolerating their vitamins and doesn't fully have Wernicke's, if they're vomiting in the ER, they need a banana bag. And Wernicke's is a clinical diagnosis. If you think they have it, just give high-dose IV thiamine for any prolonged vomiting or any neuro symptoms. And that's my contact info. If you have any other questions, email me, call me, and I'll be happy to take questions. These are the references, some very good reviews of Wernicke's. <clears throat> All right, we'll open it up for questions. So, thank you, Dr. Patterson. Yeah, go ahead. Welcome. Yep, I just want to say thank you very much for that. You've scared me even more and when it comes to thiamine deficiencies, but quite honestly, I'm very um, alert to our patients in particular post-op. My question to you is this. Number one, do you check thiamine levels pre-op? Yeah, you know, I don't actually, and I'm, I'm not against it. You know, I, I believe it's in the ASMBS guidelines, but if I check it and it's low, then I'm just going to give them thiamine, right? And so I'd rather uh, just give everybody prophylaxis. So we have everybody start thiamine two weeks before their surgery and take it for the first six months. And then we have recommend strongly that everyone take the bariatric uh, kind of vitamins that have a lot more than the average vitamin, right? So the over-the-counter vitamin, vitamins only have like one or two milligrams a day, but the bariatric ones often have like 20 or 40 milligrams, but it certainly doesn't hurt to keep them on it, but I don't test it. Okay. Yeah, we do. I mean, we do at our facility, but I just didn't know if you were just automatically doing the two week thiamine yeah. or if you were doing it based on labs. So thank you for that. I yeah. appreciate Can it. I, you're welcome. Can I ask you a question back since you're, you're testing the thiamines? How often roughly pre-op are you, do you see any low ones pre-op or no? Um, I have not actually, because I actually will see yeah. all the patients I do all the labs for the patients mm -hmm. so um if I do it's very very rarely do I see a low thiamine pre-op mm -hmm. um yeah so that might be that in the next version of the guidelines we could take that out and say hey just give everyone thiamine I think it's easier right safer. Mm -hmm. to be determined I think we're going to be working on those next yeah another version the is in the works Yep. To piggyback, just want to know please. when you're saying from two weeks pre op to six months post op, are you doing 100 milligrams? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right. I think we've got a couple questions. Julie, I think your hand is up. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. That was wonderful. You're welcome. Yeah. I'm curious because I keep asking myself this question. I know some other dietitians that are on here also do some expert witness cases. So, um, why do you think that B1 deficiency and uh, to the point of Wernke's, um, I've had some cases with legally blind, completely immobile and two deaths. So why do you think that this persists? I've been doing this for about 10 years now. Well, I just think we, we need to get the word out. I, I don't know, but I'm, um, I'm on a mission to do it. Um, I'm very good friends with the incoming president and she's kind of, I've got her on a mission to raise awareness. You know, there was that, um, I think it was 2010 when the society put out 
that. And it was very nice at the time, but there was a big poster about bariatric emergencies. And it's yes. actually in there. The Wernicke is in there. But that thing, I think we should actually redo that. Maybe I'll get Dr. Curry in to redo that thing, make it much simpler in terms of bariatric emergencies and just focus on the life-threatening ones, which Wernicke is. So we have to get the word out, but it's it's not, of course, only in us. It's all the, it's everybody, every mm-hmm. doctor, every ER, everybody. But I, I don't know, it's such an important thing, you know, the brain. So um, I'm, I'm on a mission to get the word out. Yeah. Yeah. And then I just wanted to, one last thing. Um, so um, I am now in a program or have been for a couple of years now where it's, um, I guess, lower SES. And I've been really surprised at the number of B1 deficiencies I'm seeing. So, um, pre op or post op? Pre op. Pre op. Pre op. Uh-huh. Yeah, mm-hmm. really surprising. Um, and symptomatic. So, mm-hmm. wow. Yeah. So, if we can catch it early, then they're doing much better. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, in your program, do you, do you put everyone on pre op or you just test and go from there? Um, everyone is tested pre op. And then you, who do Treat. you give time into? Um, anybody who's deficient and symptomatic, mm-hmm. if, if there's a low level, they're going to be treated, but mm-hmm. you know, the symptomatic are a little bit more of concern. And then the question is, well, should we really be doing surgery on a person who's already, you know, having these kind of issues? Yeah, exactly. You should treat and, and wait and see that they improve. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, great. Let's continue with some of the questions from the chat box. Um, see, we've got one question that says several of our surgeons tell the patients to stop taking thiamine when the when it is high in their labs as an outpatient. I tell them to not. What do you think? Keep taking it. I, it doesn't matter if the level's high. The, I mean, I'm not aware of any problem of a high uh, level. So I, I wouldn't tell them to stop based on that personally. Great. Okay. And then another one down here says, our day treatment clinic does not give banana bags, but we'll do IV thiamine. What protocol would you use in a day treatment situation for a patient that has somewhat, that is somewhat dehydrated? Um, I guess it depends where they're at post-op and if they're having any symptoms. So if they're just sort of the, you know, the one week post-op who's a bit dehydrated, um, Banana bag's nice, but I would have them give, at le- I mean, at least a hundred of thiamine. And if they have a higher dose, give it and then just put them on it orally. You know, and then of course, if they're, if they have any, any one of the three of the triad, right. And that, that makes it Wernicke's in our patients, any one of those three, then they need admission to the hospital and the IV three times a day. And, and, you know, interesting when I've come across this, because sometimes of course, most of the time, this is going to be in the early post-op period, right? In the first one or two months. But sometimes it can happen years down the road. And I've had this happen. Like someone gets lost to follow up. They've had a bypass, a band of sleeve, anything. They're, they move away for a few years and they come back. And then they get a call that, you know, so-and-so's got, you know, nausea and weakness. You know, and everyone in my office knows, uh-oh, get them up and get me on the phone with them right now, right now, or get them in here right now. I just had this happen recently, like last summer, patient moved away to Idaho with her lap band, had done well for many years, came back. She'd actually gone to one of the local ERs with Wernicke's. They hadn't realized they had sent her away. Family called my office the next day. I'm like, get her in here right now. And of course she had all the classic depressed. And she said, of course, if you listen to the patient, she could tell me, she says, I'm vomiting, but it's not my band. She says, it's not it's sticking right here and go up. It goes through the band, hits my stomach, and then it comes up. And I just don't want to eat. And I'm tired and I'm weak. I examine her eyes. She's got nystagmus. I watch her walk. She's all slow and wide gait. I'm like, over the ear right now. We had some, you know, oral thiamines. I thought, well, may as well throw some oral in you right now. Let's throw a couple pills down, get you over the ER. And then unfortunately, it's so not known that when you do have a patient, you want to admit them to the hospital, you have to really, really advocate strongly. So typically, I find I'll have to talk to at least three doctors to get the patient admitted, you know, or I can just admit them myself, but it's not, a, you know, it's not exactly a surgery thing when it's five years out. It's Wernicke's isolated, right? No problem with the band. 
In that patient, I took fluid out of her band just to rule that out, but it wasn't the problem. So typically I find you have to talk to a call, talk to the ear doc, explain to them, this is Wernicke's, get them right in, give the first dose, high dose stat. And they say, oh yeah, yeah, we'll do that. Of course, by the time they get back, the shifts change, the next ear doc's calling me, have to give my whole explanation again. Okay, we'll give that dose. And then I'm like, yeah, call medicine, get her admitted. Then I got to talk to that doctor and say, oh yeah, please, please admit her for at least three days. And, and that's um, how it goes. And so that last patient, I went to visit her actually probably every three days for two weeks. She ended up staying there for two weeks. And her mental fog, her family had said she was quite foggy. Her fog cleared quite a bit. I'd walk with her down the halls. You say the nurses were looking at me like, what's, what's the surgeon doing walking the hall with a patient? Like, we don't see that. I'd walk her, watch her gait each day, and it gradually improved. And her hand numbness and tingling grad, gradually improved. So she improved quite a bit, but it had been going on for a few months. So she still had some... Um, she had some cognitive issues uh, permanently after that. Yeah, but you really have to go to bat and stick with your guns. It's a clinical diagnosis, you know? And we, we had, even though she got some oral thiamine in the office, when she got to the hospital, we sent off a level. I mean, it was still low. It was low. So it proved the diagnosis after the fact. Yeah, well, that's... The serious thing, that's absolutely true. We got to take it very seriously. Yeah. Um, okay. There's another one that says, do you have any specific protocol, uh, quote unquote, a cutoff level for sending folks to the ER if they're not symptomatic? They're not symptomatic. Mm, I think they're meaning like the level, like a blood level probably. Oh, you know, again, I'm hardly looking at the blood levels because it comes back after I've diagnosed and treated it, right? And it's just sort of that intellectual curiosity. So not symptomatic. Well, I think, um, and if you have anyone who has persistent vomiting, right, we got to take care of their fluids, right? We're always thinking fluids, fluids and thiamine. I mean, they're just going to go together, fluids and thiamine, at least a banana bag. And I kind of see it like this really, um, in terms of prevention, there's sort of the primary, secondary, and tertiary levels of prevention, right? So the primary level, we should all be eating healthy food and maybe take a multivitamin. The secondary level, people at higher risk, our patients, anyone vomiting, they need a bariatric vitamin or they need a banana bag. And then the tertiary prevention is, okay, they've got Wernicke's, but if I diagnose and treat it quickly, it's going to resolve. It's all going to resolve. And I have had those patients where they're vomiting, they're not walking properly. It's in the first two months of surgery and with the high dose IV thumb and they completely get back to normal, you know, and that's, we want to not get to that level, but if we diagnose and treat early, it's, uh, it prevents the Korsakovs, which is devastating. By the time they get to the Korsakovs, it doesn't matter what the thiamine level is. The brain damage is done and no amount of thiamine is going to fix it. Yeah. All right, great. Um, let's see. We've got another question it says we do mostly sleeves. We check B1, whole blood, and patients at their pre-surgical lab. Every once in a while, they are low, which we treat. Um, after surgery, we do have patients who have elevated levels. Any concern with elevation? Um, we check again at six months and one year after surgery. Yeah, I don't think there's any concern with, with high levels that I have found anywhere. Great. Yeah. Okay. Another one says, thank you for the great presentation. How much thiamine do you recommend for patients who are readmitted for a complication? So that's probably the high dose that you were talking about. Yeah. Well, the high dose, if they have, um, if they're not, you know, if they're not keeping anything down, they have neuro complications, but say if they, I mean, that is what I, what I tend to do, I guess. So say if they're coming in with a sleeve leak at three weeks, well, they may not have Wernicke's at that point, but they're probably going to be on TPN for a couple of weeks. And generally there's, it varies, but generally I see there's, there's always some thyme in the TPN, but at most a hundred. And so um, I do give more than just to prevent it. Cause I know, you know, that's all they're getting. I will have the pharmacy give like 250 twice a day for the first few days. And, and the thing is, if they're getting sick with other things, they're, say, they're septic, bowel obstruction, really sick reoperations, that 
TPN is on the back burner, right? It doesn't start it for a few days. It's constantly getting turned off or on or, and sometimes there's a low dose Simon in there. So it's, like I said, I often see it as a secondary problem. It's like, oh, wow, you've saved the patient's life from the leak and they're okay. But now, you know, and the nutrition was fine for a while on the TPN, or then you send them home and they're still struggling or, or they're, there was a delay in the TPN and the secondary problem is the Wernicke's that gets missed. And that's kind of, that's just seems doubly sad if they've had a surgery complication and you fixed it and then you miss the one that's really the easy fix, IV thiamine. But I see that a fair amount also. Yeah, I've seen it in our clinical practice as well. It's, it, it's sad when you miss it because it's just it's staring you right in the face sometimes. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But this um, and, can be subtle, you know, it can be quite subtle. Yeah, absolutely. All right, then we've got another one saying, do you advise patients to stop their bariatric supplements 24 hours prior to blood drops? So, and maybe you guys can educate me on this. We don't, I don't have them stop their multivitamin, but I just have them stop their biotin. The only one that I'm aware of that interferes with the labs is the biotin you know, which there's a little bit in the multivitamin, but the high dose, we give them extra biotin. So we do have them stop that three days before because that can affect their B12 and D levels or, or all, that I know that the biotin uh, does. If anyone has any other info on that, raise your hand and can educate us. But that's what I do. Continue the multivitamin, just hold the biotin three days. And now we've even, in our, you know, we we... We include the vitamins in our in our program package to get them started on the right ones, and we sell them in the office here. Now, my staff have put little stickers on the biotin bottles that says "Stop it three days before your labs." Or you just seeing all these high B12s and and D, which I think high B12 doesn't matter, but high real high D can cause some problems. So you want to know if it's high or not, right? My favorite is when they go get their B12 injection and then they get their labs right afterwards. I'm like, oh, oh yeah. well, come on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See some high ones. Yeah. Well, I think those are all the questions that we have that I can see. Anyone else have anything else? It still says, okay. I saw 11 in the chat. Did you do all those? Oh, that's other people chatting about things. All right. I think there was a couple comments talking about that the, that they would agree that a specific recommendation of thiamine would be beneficial and having that emergency poster be updated with the B12, B1 as well. So a couple yeah. comments. Yeah, and it then... does. That emergency poster does have the B1 on there. It's just there's so much stuff crowded into that poster that I... I think it gets lost, you know, it's right at the top of that thing on the emergencies that it, it's there and, and it, uh, Wernicke's. And then I think it's in that yellow column to the left. It, it has it in there, but to me, there's too much stuff on that. I, and I'd be glad to help whichever committee is going to do that thing and really just simplify it and get the word out. It'd be very helpful. They also ask, can you share your reference page again? Yes. Let me. See, so there are a few pages, but let's go back there. Mm, hang on, let me go to the. I'll just jump ahead to the references. Okay, here we go. Mm. Now I'm testing me on the technology here. Now let's see. Here we go. Okay. Okay. Well, here's the first page. Let's see uh, which ones I particularly like. And there's more. Um, this is a great little one on the bottom right here by, by Flynn. <clears throat> and I think it's so true. I love the title too. Increasing clinician awareness of this serious enigmatic yet treatable disease. So that one is a great review. <clears throat> and there's the systematic review. Bariatrics, the banana bag, and then let's see. And they can get seizures too. Don't seek, don't find. That is a great one. Um, OTA, this one again on the bottom right. I think that one is a really great uh, review and has all the radiology images. And of course, we have our wonderful guidelines. And then 
Yeah. Uh, Udman is a big name for sure in the um, in the Wernicke's field. So they have some great papers. Oh, yeah, I forgot to include this part from the Texas Medical Liability Trust, but they, you know, they put out this alert in 2016 about Wernicke's being a complication of bariatric surgery and under-recognized. So this was like an alert to the attorneys. Um, so those are a bunch of good ones. Yeah, and there is some data, actually, that's right, in this tank. There is some data on uh, the, the prevalence of thiamine deficiency pre-op. It was fairly significant, actually, um, which is surprising. And I think that's why I just thought I'm just going to treat everyone with this after some of the um, terrible uh, cases that I have reviewed. I, I just don't want to ever have that happen on one of my patients. All right, you're welcome. Anything else? I think there might have been a few more that got placed, a few more questions that got put on the Q&A panel that I didn't have access to, but our lovely ASMBS person has sent oh. me a message about them. So okay. let's see. First question was, are we going to have availability to see the PowerPoint? Um, I think we will be able to, um, I think that'll it's be okay. Recorded and they're going to send you that, I think. Perfect. Yep. Mm hmm and then, okay, let's see here. Oh, I just saw someone said, where can we find that ER resource? It is somewhere on the ASMBS website. It is. It's hidden in some somewhere, resource, I think. Somewhere it's in the resources. It's from either 2010 or 2011. Someone here, uh, Jean Hudson has a hand up there. I don't know if you're able to. Yeah. Um, just a quick question. I, I missed it. When you're supplementing someone with B1 um, pre-op, what dose are you using and for what length of time? The 100 milligrams daily. So starting two weeks pre-op, well, about six months post-op. Three months is probably plenty, but six months. So you're doing that in addition to the, the bariatric vitamin that they all get as well? Um, yeah. Well, here's another one. Why is it that the U.S. does not have formal thymine repletion guidelines? Yeah, I don't. I don't know. There is a. Um, there are some guidelines from one of the neuro societies. I think it was European, though. Yeah, I, I don't know, but we. Um, we should. I think it was a European neurologic society has uh, guidelines about this. It's another good reference. Let's see someone's. So I, I'll share with you that on the ASMBS website, if you go to the store, the poster is on the store. And I don't think it's of charge. You can download it for free. You can go to Staples or any other um, office type of store and make a poster out of it. Uh, and it's. Yeah, it's I a great. It's, it's a great reference still for the ERs. I and mean, I think it should be hanging in every ER. And people go give talks to their ear docs, but um, it's been a long time. So I think it is time for a refreshed one, really highlighting the, uh, I think they just tried to put too much in that one poster. I think that the key points get, get lost in there. You know, I, yeah, we got a couple more hands up here. Uh, Judith. Hi there. Thank you for a great presentation. Uh, Quick question, do you, off the top of your head, um, the prevalence of uh, thiamine deficiency between gastric bypass patients and sleeve patients. Um, the reason I'm asking is because majority of our patients are sleeve gastrectomy patients. And I also, uh, I'm involved with the support groups and we discuss complications that are not as much when you compare between the two surgeries. Um, and I'm always talking about with the gastric bypass, you'll have nutritional deficiencies uh, like we discussed here, but I'm just wondering what the difference is, if you've seen any, if it's big, if it's major or so between the two types of surgeries. Yeah, I think the difference, you know, theoretically, it could be more with the gut bypass, right? Because mm -hmm. of the decreased absorption. Mm -hmm. But in reality, I don't mm -hmm. think there's a difference. And mm -hmm. 
the majority of the cases that I'm seeing and doing also are mostly are slaves, but most of the cases that I have reviewed as an expert have been slaves. So, okay. you know, um, and actually I would think, I think perhaps uh, vomiting and dehydration might even be more mm -hmm. common with the sleeve. So I, mm -hmm. I, um, it's not, I don't think it's any less with the sleeve. And I don't, I don't think it's a, you know, differential in terms of choosing surgery. I think it's something that every patient needs to be aware of. Sure, sure. My, my education process going forward now, uh, when I talk with the patients, uh, will include that. Uh, and I'll spend more emphasis on that. So I, I appreciate that knowledge. Okay. Very welcome. Thank you. And Jean, you have another question? Jean Hudson? Oh, sorry, I forgot to put my hand down. Well, that's okay. You guys are sophisticated. I barely know how to put the hand up or down. <laughs> I think we're coming up at our hour here in a little bit, but if there's any final questions, this has been a great discussion, guys. Thank you so much, Dr. Patterson. Very welcome. All right. Okay. Well, then I'm going to, um, I think you guys have like a networking session. Um, I got to go. So I'm going to uh, bow out, but thanks so much for having me. So happy to have you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Hope to see you around Portland us. sometime. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Nice to meet you. All right. Take you care. You too. Karen. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you.